is really important because you've heard it, it all depends on sales. And the demand side is, is really where uh, we're, we're seeing people leaving the state uh, because we have not enough housing that, that people can afford. So I think the two panelists, I appreciate your coming here to talk about how we can help buyers uh, to qualify for loans to buy the leasehold condos. Our first presenter is Manny August. Uh, he's vice president and senior residential loan officer at American Savings Bank. Uh, he served 16 years in the industry uh, in home loans. Uh, so uh, he also serves on the um, College of Business School of Accountancy Advisory Board. So he comes with uh, a lot of experience to help us look at uh, how we can help buyers uh, qualify for loans. Manny? Hi, everyone. So actually, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Senator Chang, for asking me to come out and speak today. <clears throat> so Senator Chang asked me to speak about basically you know, what, it, what it would take to get people financed for you know, these, this potential project that we're looking at in regards to about a three hundred thousand uh, dollar leasehold, you know, property, right? But um, what I'm going to just talk about, just real quick, I'll, I'll skip this because you guys want to get to lunch, so I'm not going to go over too much about myself. But um, you know, I'm, the reason why people buy is because of pretty much these five things. You know, stability. They want to be able to live in a home and not, uh, you know, uh, have a landlord kick them out, right? I mean, they want to be able to stay in that property. Security, they want to know what their mortgage payment's going to be going forward for a period of time. I mean, if you rent, you don't know what the projected, you know, like maybe two, three years down the road, they might start to increase your rent on you. Um, build wealth, that's something that me and Senator Chang talked a lot about, you know, with the shared appreciation component, whether or not, you know, that's going to be something that a lot of people might frown upon um, with this strategy. Um, tax savings, also when you get a mortgage, a lot of people will say that you can get some tax benefits. However, you know, with the new tax Trump laws, uh, you know, it just depends when you, um, for financing today's market. And then also for the future generations, if you have a 99 year lease, you know, of course you can pass that on to, you know, your, your children and so on. Um, but for leasehold, you know, you own just the, the structure and not the land. And that's something that, you know, uh, you know, in, in Hawaii, the land is, is, is where, the, where the, a lot of the money is, right? Uh, <clears throat> now, for leasehold, you know, of course, there's going to be a component of what's called lease rent. And that's going to be something that, you know, of course, is going to be in the agreement. But, you know, whatever that lease rent is, uh, like my dad owned the property in Winter Estates a long time ago in Kamehameha Schools, was the, the fee owner. And uh, I think he paid about $250 a month. And but in the, in the lease agreement, that lease rent can actually go up over time. And so truly when we qualify bars, that lease rent is built into that calculation of what that bar can qualify for. Now, on the, um, for, for financing, uh, you know, right now for 99 year lease, there's no issues to get financing. Uh, it's it's very it's pretty straightforward as long as the, the plan that's put forth is approved by the different investors. Most lenders will finance up to five years before the lease expires. So if it's a 99 year lease, we're really not going to have any issues for financing until you get to about well, that 35 year lease period. So I mean, we're, I mean, really, we don't have to have this conversation today. We could have it about 60 years from now. That's when we're going to really start having potential challenges. But if you look at a, um, you know, when the lease starts to get down to like 35 years, lenders can only finance up to five years before the lease expires. So we can do a 30-year fixed mortgage at that point. But as the lease starts to get to like 34, 33, and so on, we have to start actually reducing the term for qualifications. Now, when we start to reduce the term, qualifications become a little bit more of a challenge. Um, we, most lenders can actually finance up to 10 years on a mortgage term at the, at the um, minimum. But <clears throat> there's five different investors that we look at. We have Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, HUD, which is FHA, VA, and then USDA. Uh, each of these basically have different requirements for leasehold financing. Uh, like I said earlier, typically most of the programs at Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and our portfolio lenders, they're going to be looking at five years uh, you know, for that lease term. Uh, five years, uh, we won't finance more than five years before the lease exp expires. 
uh, for FHA, they're looking at 10 years. So if you have a 40 year mortgage, I'm sorry, 40 year term on the lease remaining, they can do a 30 year. Uh, US, and the USDA loans, which is rural housing, they require at least 45 years. Uh, for VA, for some odd reason, they require 14 years. And then also for, like, like I said, Fannie Mae and like Freddie Mac, we require just five years before the lease expires. Now, the down payment uh, you know, that we require for this is gonna be basically as low as 3% for your Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans. FHA requires three and a half. If you can actually get VA to approve the structure, you can probably do it with 0% down on a VA loan. And then for rural housing or the USDA loan, they basically also do 100% financing, but the property itself has to be in a geographically, um, uh, in an area that's approved for USDA. Now, I think a lot of the areas that you know, was in the plans may not fall within the USDA requirements. So really the only 100% financing program that may be avail um, available will probably be VA. So, you know, for qualifications, basically, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, we, we, um, even though it's a leasehold, we're still gonna require your income, your assets, and, uh, you know, credit to make sure that you can actually qualify for repayment. Um, Senator Chang asked me, basically, well, you know, what, would, what kind of income would a family need to earn in order to qualify for a $300,000 leasehold property? Now, a lot of it just depends because where rates are gonna be down the road when these projects are done, we don't really know that. But let's say, for, to, for example, today, if this, there is a unit available, you're looking at maybe about $63,000 in um, gross income for a family to qualify basically for a $300,000 purchase with like 3% down. Now, if they put 20% down, they could probably qualify today at about 51,000. So the price that they are setting forth is very affordable, and I think it's definitely gonna help um, you know, a lot of people once they can get this off the ground, hopefully down the road. But um, I know that in the previous panel, there was a question about um, retirement accounts, and can you use your retirement accounts for a down payment? That's really more for our conversation, because um, we can use those assets to help with that for a down payment to help you qualify. So that also is something that um, definitely a, a lot of borrowers use today. And it, um, even when this project hopefully gets rolled out, we'll be able to use that um, the, you know, retirement accounts for a down payment at that time as well. But that's pretty much all I had to share. So I'll wait for Q&A, because I know, again, you guys want to get to lunch. So um, we can pick up. Thank you, Manny. I think we'll have more questions about how you, you do actually work with uh, the buyers so that they can qualify for these, these kinds of programs uh, versus commercial, getting commercial loans as well. Uh, the next speaker we have is Evan Tom. He's a senior real estate specialist and realtor associate at Caldwell Banker. He's coming at fr from, the, um, from the real estate area and how you get connect up the buyer with the uh, properties. Thank you, Evan. So thanks so much for Senator Chang to introduce and to include me in this. I know that I'm probably the youngest person that's going to be on the panel, so I don't know if he chose me because I'm your typical example of, you know, you go off to college, and if you're lucky enough, your parents will pay or partially pay for your education, and then you want to come home at some point and you realize, man, it's really tough to buy a house on your own. Um, but just to give you a little bit about my background and why it might be important is my dad was realtor himself. He's done a, one of the only um, kind of affordable housing projects in Wahiwa, which is where our family on that side grew up. Uh, before I came into the industry, I worked in escrow, so I got a lot of experience in all of those aspects, including lending. So some of these, um, a lot of the numbers, because I'm a very big numbers-based guy, is to give guidelines of information at least for the buyer because a lot of times when they start the search and as I go through this I'll kind of um, go over the process the issues that buyers typically have and kind of the framework to solving that into getting to the solution 
Okay, so I have a few objectives here really in the next five or 10 minutes is four things. One is to understand why financing is important in home buying as it relates obviously to this project. Kind of the rent versus buy argument because a lot of it ends up being a financial argument of you know where is it worth doing and how much is that additional premium for owning it going to be. I'll break down some of the programs with numbers and now well I'll break down sort of the affordable programs or more examples of um, what's currently available. So ultimately it's really to, to reframe the question and why we're here today is to talk about how we can make it possible. So the process that typically works for a lot of buyers, this is your um, cycle, cycle as you can say, is you'll meet with a realtor professional, get pre-approved, and then you'll start searching for homes. But the truth is most buyers will start with that. They'll start searching for homes, probably do it six to 12 months, don't really know what they're doing. They go to places they really would like to buy, but they actually have no idea about how the actual numbers break down. And so when I sit my open houses, especially that's one of the things that I think is important to get give them that clarity. So that's kind of the goal of um, the first conversation to have is to take them a step back and help them to understand how all of the financing works. And obviously I'm not a lender, so this is more guidelines and this is something that everyone's specific financial situation is different and that's part of that pre-qualification process. But when we're talking about straight purchase benefits, there's a number of different programs. Uh, the first for the lending programs for Home Ready and Home Possible, these are like your lower down payment, lower AMI, so they relate specifically to this is options if we were to get financing through it that really lowers the monthly costs. Um, in terms of the credits themselves, specific lenders will have like first time home buyer credits where they'll give you some type of closing costs or typically that's kind of the program. The MCC program is one of those huge benefits on top of the mortgage interest deduction. So basically the, the biggest uh, reasons you'd buy is you can deduct your interest and your MCC, if it's available, um, effectively doubles that. So it just makes it where when you talk about the rent versus buying, it's a very, it's a lot more in line and manageable. And then obviously it's the price premium of what your security is going to be, which is you know ultimately up to the buyer themselves. Um, so potential numbers for this project, you know, if we estimate it's going to be about a three hundred thousand dollar, as Stanley says, if we assume maintenance is about five hundred, and that would probably include a pool. Um, that interest rates at about four point five percent, because as a project you don't know what the interest rates are until the project's close to closing. So that's somewhat above market rate of about four percent. So if we assume that you know the condo type is a two bedroom, that these are sort of some of the down payment options. As you can see here that it ranges from about 15,000 all the way up to 65. Um, but you can see that on the top line, that's what you're paying out of pocket and potentially on the bottom line, what you're going to be paying with your credits that you're going to be getting. So you can kind of see that when you consider all of these factors of the benefits of buying, that it changes it from, eh, it's really hard to stomach to, oh yeah, yeah, it makes sense, right? So that's kind of the, the big thing for a lot of the buyers when they're starting this and especially in terms of trying to get support for this type of project is understanding the fact that if I could get you a new project, 3% down, $1,900 a month for something new for two bedrooms, I mean, that's pretty much a shoe in victory for you. Um, so the options now for two bedrooms, uh, 801 South is kind of your example of the most affordable condo in town. A two bedroom market rate that did sell unit 4202 as a comp. Purchase price was 725, maintenance was 304. So it's relatively, it's very low, honestly, because they don't have anything. But you know, I think a lot of the people that are my age, they don't really care about it as much. They'd rather just pay less money and probably spend it on food downstairs. So those options really when you look at the costs is it's really not affordable. I mean I don't really know, have to go over the numbers specifically even on the top line that $3,000 with 20% I mean, who can come up with $155,000 on their own without their parents involved? Because a lot of the people that, for me, for my first time home buyers and any realtors in the room, essentially they can qualify, but they have no down payment or they have a lot of debt uh, up to here. 
So these are just photos. Again, 801 is your most basic and affordable two bedroom, but even at the market rate, it's just not there. So really, I'll summarize this. I'll kind of go over some questions that I have for as takeaways and some thoughts as well, because I did work on you know a lot of leasehold when I was in escrow, and I'm out actually doing my own lease fee um, conversion. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Is you know what what's the purpose and what's more important? Because whenever you buy something, you're giving up a lot of things. And usually you'll have your top three, top five criteria. One is going to be financials. And I think that's one of the biggest ones that people don't understand until they understand. Um, but you know, if, if it's something that can be possible, this is just, again, the reason we're here to explore how to make it work. Right, and um, you know the truth is, you know, unfortunately, a lot of things change. As you even saw Singapore as it's developed, that it's vastly different after this development. But if you ask the question of if it was worth it, I think that everyone would say yes. So typically, the buyer issues that you have in this type of group of what you're trying to serve is that at the 60 to 80 percent of your AMI, this is your lower income that you know could presumably afford it, is that credit is an issue. I, I've just closed on a family in which, you know, they're your very typical, you know, three kids trying to buy a place and the, the mom's going to pay for the down payment, but they barely scrape by at the minimum of that 600 credit score. And the fact is that a lot of these things to buy, it's a long-term goal. It doesn't start today. If, if you want to start today to buy, it's going to be five or ten years. So there's a lot of things in terms of hurdles for education that I think are very important in trying to solve for them. The other thing is down payment, as I previously mentioned, is how even at that 3% of $15,000, I mean, who can by themselves save $15,000? See, the other thing to talk about is, you know, as Manny said, is about lease and lease rent is for, you know, I've done a lot of calculations um, as an example for Wailana. And the fact is every time there's a leasehold step up, which happens typically every 10 years for any type of leasehold property currently, is the property value significantly drops. And if I had more time, I'd show you some graphs and charts that essentially show the diversion of as leasehold value I mean, as the time on the lease decreases, it, it really does not increase. It, it just flatlines or decreases significantly, especially when there's a step up in rent. Versus uh, equity producing fee simple property that you really see that divergence. And so that's kind of the issue, one of the issues you'll have is, you know, will the state want to try to collect leasehold rent down the line? Because I think we're all assuming that the state's going to either provide it for free, but even though you've seen it with the Bicky projects of them trying to do something good, that now they're trying to say, hey, you have to pay us, right? So those are, I think, two of the big questions to ask. Um, but ultimately, this whole conversation changes really our definition of housing. And it's kind of the conversation of basic human rights, of what's important and necessary. And I think that, you know, housing is a basic necessity, and that's why we are having it as the biggest issue that we're trying to solve. But ultimately, you know, I think the fact that it's leasehold keeps the cost down as a solve. But the kind of issues that come up is, do you actually own the property? You know, what happens in terms of any types of lease rent? And then especially down the line, kind of what happens. So again, it just changes our definition of housing to more of a utility. Um, and that's kind of a conversation that's kind of hard to, to handle or to get a really good solution on. But that's that's everything for me. Thank you. Thank you, Manny and Evan. Um, uh, I have a question in terms of, unless we have anybody else with questions, um, the, the first time buyer or any buyer, uh, as, as Evan is saying, has difficulty coming up with a down payment. Is there any program or are there programs or what can we do in terms of helping the, the buyer with that, that first part, the, the down payment? 
Um, uh, the only program I know available is HHOC, and they're more of a state or nonprofit type of organization in which they have essentially a down payment assistant program called DPAC, and of course it depends on kind of your situation financially, but they can offer up to $10,000 um, in terms of down payment assistance. It's kind of interest or no interest loan, which is interesting. Um, but it's one of those ways that if you're trying to get a buyer or if you're a buyer yourselves, is one of the only ways to solve that. And outside of that, I mean, ultimately, you, you kind of just have to ask your parents. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there's also, um, there used to be a city and county down payment assistance program, about $40,000 they would help contribute. I'm not too sure if that's still in place today, but I know that's always an opportunity. Um, but like what Evan said, um, Bank of Mom and Dad is probably your, <laughs> your, your best bet for down payment assistance. I mean, there is other programs out there, but you know, for a leasehold property, mostly I mean, depending on how it's structured, a lot of the different organizations that will help with the down payment, they're gonna wanna see basically, you know, if they're gonna get repaid, they wanna make sure that the terms that, you know, how it's structured makes sense for them. So even all the different loan programs, the FHA, VA, they're all gonna wanna review the terms to make sure that they can actually lend upon it. So the more the terms can be accommodating to basically, you know, these different investors, then like, like I said, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they have a 3% down payment program. And they're on a $300,000 purchase, that's nine grand. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, that should be attainable. And then there is sources, hopefully, that you know, from your retirement, you can maybe use your IRA or borrow from your 401k. So a lot of times when I meet with clients, I'm always trying to figure out other ways that they can potentially get the funds to, to make, make their home ownership come, you know, come true. Are there any, you, you were mentioning new, new buyer programs. Um, is there any, any more give in terms of you know, for the new owners? Um, I, I mean, basically, that's those are the options that you do have. Um, you know, it's the hard thing to to understand for a lot of people is you know the difference between three and five percent from a down payment isn't that significant, but sometimes the actual monthly payments are where you know if you can foreseeably save up enough that it's worth it. So I, I know that um, again, this is all the consumer side stuff, um, but conceptually to to understand understand is that, you know, I, I meet with a lot of buyers and they ask, oh, why don't I try to save more money? And the fact is, you know, as we all know that you're never really going to keep up with it and you have to start somewhere. So it's one of those arguments to say that, you know, if you can try to figure it out to do it because of how stable prices are here, but there's really not too much wiggle room in terms of anything below the 3%. Thank you. Can, can I? Oh. We have one more question, and, and then we'll wrap it up. The mic. The mic. Uh, it's a simple question, which is, uh, from your experience with buyers here on Oahu, um, are people, most first-time buyers, coming in with the three or the five percent because I know I saw a study that said that on the mainland, the average down payment for a first-time home buyer is seven percent. So for last year, the average was seven percent. Um, and it matters in terms of affordability and all the models and all that kind of thing. But I haven't seen a study for um, Hawaii specifically, but my feeling was that it was probably lower because our housing costs are so much higher. Um, but I'm curious in your experience, what would you put that you know, average number at? Um, I mean, I've probably done over the last 17 years, maybe several thousand loans, and I would say a very small handful put 3% down or less. Uh, I think in Hawaii, the one thing that there is a lot of family support, and I think that's something that uh, you know, a lot of family members do help out to actually increase the down payment to make it a little bit more affordable. However, it is a, it is a huge issue. I mean, I, I turn away a lot of bars that, you know, um, credit I think in Hawaii is actually a lot better than maybe the states. Uh, but uh, down payment is definitely a challenge because it's the cost of you know the housing here. But uh, overall, I would say, most of my bars are probably putting 10% down. 
Um, even first-time home buyers, because a lot of those first-time home buyers are getting a lot of family assistance, mostly if you're local family here. Um, if you're moving here from the mainland, coming here, a little bit more of a challenge if you don't have family here. However, I, based on just the loans I've done over the years, I would say a lot of the local family, you know, like, like families have helped out a lot of my um, local buyers. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll answer it as well. I think that there's a few things here is that the people that can afford and the people that can't. Um, and so, you know, as Manny said, a lot of them have the ability to get to a bank of mom or dad. Um, but the ones that really don't, I would say it's, in my experience, that it's a little bit closer to the five, maybe 10% at the most. But, um, you know, the hard thing is that the cost just really go up between the three or when you go down to the three percent because there's PMI um, so as much as possible it ends up being where it's an adjustment more so of what their expectations are um, in terms of what they can afford that I think is one of the biggest shocks is that they think they can afford this and they think they can get this type of house but when you actually run the numbers on it you know they really can't so that's that's sort of the where the education is important and pre-fronting it is so they don't run into that issue because a lot of ones that if you search on your own, that's the issue you typically run into. Okay, thank, thank you, Manny, Evan. Um, I'm going to wrap it up, but I want to thank both of you very much for this is a challenging part of, of, you know, we have the supply and we're trying to bring down the cost, but really working with the buyers so that we have the sale made. Thank you.